Blackwing and her talons flew with us part of the way, delivering the news of their victory back to Gaud, along with the details of a five-year plan that the Overmare and Blackwing had stretched out upon my suggestion. Y'all sure we shouldn't stand here with you at Stable 29? No, Steel was told Calamity. This is an internal matter now. I listened to DJ Potent 3's broadcast in my ear bloom, but there had been no news yet of Stable 2. Nothing I could forewarn the elders about the ranks were breaking. I prayed that the silence would last until I reached homage. It was another stroke of luck that Calamity Shack was only a little bit out of our way towards Fetlock and Manhattan. It was, however, in the completely opposite direction of Splendid Valley. I began to worry what Red Eye might do if we delayed too long. I was hoping that his twisted generosity would extend to giving me time to rest after everything I'd gone through. What will we do once we reach Ten Pony Tower? Zenith asked. Will Red Eye even let you go there? Night Strawberry Lemonade asked, moving to a bench near me. Sulu's had managed to successfully maneuver behind several other Steel Rangers, preventing her from reaching him. I found the little dance amusing, particularly because her voice was so cute. Even more so coming from inside that fearsome armor. And partially because it was finally some pony's turn to feel a little uncomfortable. Reda has the place surrounded, I said, frowning. Shooting our way in would be a bad move, but we could try sneaking our way in. I recall that Homage said in her fake letter to me. Then, later, we can meet where we met before, and I promise. Well, <clears throat> no need to dwell on what she promised. The important part was, I know a roof access that Red Eye's troops probably don't know, and I believe Homage is waiting for us to land there. I nodded. Um, the others nodded. And Zenith looked concerned. Will they even allow a zebra inside? Homage will, I assured her. Zenith may not get the run of the tower, but there was no way we were leaving her out in the cold. As we approached the turning point for Calamity's shack, Black Wings swooped close, flying alongside the Sky Bandit. The Griffin signaled me. Do you think Godwinna will be satisfied with the payment? I called out over the rush of the wind. Blackwing barked a laugh. I think she'll be surprised. Disrupted, maybe. She was hoping for rights to draw from Stable 2's water talisman. Instead, she's getting an offer to move the entire damn population of Stable 2, as well as its most valuable assets, to her domain. As Velvet Remedy had determined, Stable 2 could not afford to remain isolated for much longer. The population needed to genetically spread, to include new breeding stock from the outside. But they couldn't just open the stable door. Now a stable tuned to the edge of the Everfree Forest, and an hour's trot from Raider territory. They needed to move. Shattered Hoof provided additional population and safety. With this plan, the Water Talisman would be moved to Junction R7, and the entire subterranean apple orchard would be relocated to the mines underneath Shattered Hoof. The ponies of Stable 2 would start building homes in the land between Junction R7 and the old prison. It would be a massive undertaking, but then New Appaloosa had been built by Earth Ponies in a single year. I felt odd knowing that my new home was going to become my old home. Within five years, Junction R7 was going to be the center of a town. I'm more worried about the delay, I cried out. It's going to be a few months, at best, before the ponies in Stable 2 can actually start to move. Right now, the area outside the stable is just too dangerous. The Everfree Forest exodus, however, is just a part of the problem. I was even more worried about the retaliation from the Steel Rangers. For now, the stable was sealing itself up again. The ponies of Stable 2 needed time to process and cope with the trauma. They needed time to clean the stable and rebuild their lives. They wouldn't be able to forget, and part of me thought it was good. 
as it would prevent them from losing sight of what they owed and the changes they needed to be made. God's patient, Blackwing commented, but you've got other problems. Only way to ferry the orchard to Shattered Hoof is by rail, and those tracks pass through New Appaloosa. Crap. That's right. We'll work something out, I assured her, but I've got to deal with Red Eye first. I sounded more confident than I felt, but Calamity's words had reminded me that while there might be questionable or even downright villainous ponies in the high places in New Appaloosa, the bulk of the townsfolk were really good ponies. Hell, Ditsy Doo lived there. The thought of a ghoul Pegasus brought up another responsibility. I had to find a way to thank her. We all owed our lives to her. Without those stealth bucks, which she had given freely to Blackwing in saving the ponies of our home. I moved away from the edge of the Sky Bandit as Blackwing veered off and the other other griffins followed closely. Butcher blew a kiss in our direction. I think it was for steel hooves, but I had no idea why. Maybe just the camaraderie that comes from mutual love of excessive firepower. Calamity winged us in the other direction. This won't take long, I assured Steelhooves and the outcasts. That's one giant cloud of scary black smoke, Calamity commented as we approached his shack. The smoke from the Everfree Forest fires had tainted the air with an angry, solemn hue. Calamity's shack, nestled halfway up a rugged plateau, was slightly closer to New Appaloosa than it was to the closest border of the Free Forest. But while it was nowhere near the fires, the prevailing winds were blowing the smoke for miles. I had grown accustomed to the strange, sickly quiet of the outside air, but Scootaloo's pipbuck message brought back memories. The first morning in the questioning wasteland, how the sheer oddness of it struck me. This was altogether different. I could smell unnatural odors writing in the smoke. I could taste something pungently bitter sweet with each breath. Should we be breathing this? I asked Velvet Remedy. I was reminded of the dangers of working in the Paris Bright Incinerator pits. Did any pony know what nastiness the smoke from the Everfree Forest might carry with it? I suddenly envied the Steel Rangers, outcasts and otherwise for their rebreathers built into their armored suits. Probably not, Valremdi said, doing absolutely nothing to assure, uh, alleviate my fears. The cliffs around the shack were precarious, with no safe path to ascend, and no outcropping to land the passenger wagon on. It was, after all, a home for a pegasus. Calamity was forced to land on the base of the cliffs, after a brief discussion, it was suggested that Calamity and I would head up alone. Oh no, Velvet Remedy put her hoof down. You did not bring us all the way here, Calamity, to your old home, only to not let me see it. Calamity nickered, looking apprehensive and a bit embarrassed. Come on now, Velvet purred. I showed you mine, now you show me yours. I tried very hard to, to think of other things. Tell you what, I'll levitate myself up there while you two fly up. Can you do that, little Pip? Levitate yourself that far? To be honest, I wasn't sure. Self-levitation had always been the hardest trick for me. I wanted to give it a try, but I didn't want to suffer the fall if I failed. Be ready to catch me? I asked meekly. Clemity nodded, stretching out his wings confidently. Somewhere behind me, I heard Zenith ask some pony. Why do they not just make two trips? I looked up, horn, uh, pointing my horn towards the shack. I swallowed nervously. It was very high. My horn began to glow. Focusing, I enveloped my body with a magical envelope, envelope and pushed off from the ground. I had done this much before. But just as in the pit, my ascent had begun to slow rapidly. I focused harder and tried to pull myself upwards. I was still slowing. 
I concentrated, sweat breaking on my forehead and running down my neck. An overglow floated on my horn, casting reflections off the cliff rocks. I stopped slowing. I was doing it. I was pulling myself through the air. I was pushing exhaustion. The effort was almost painful, but I was doing it. I was flying. I lay on the little strip of wood that amounted to Calamity's front porch, panting heavily. My legs didn't want to hold me up. Oh, they could if I asked, but they didn't want to. It was worth it, for just a little bit of actual flying. It had not been a graceful act of freedom, as I was neither a pegasus nor a bird. It had been work, like galloping uphill against the wind. But I had done it. And for a moment, all the horrors and pain of the last few days was forgotten in the rush and exertion. I wondered how long it would take Calamity to fly up here with Velvet Remedy. Not long, my mind answered swiftly. In fact, I was surprised they weren't here already. I remember that I still had a memory orb from one of the safes in Philadelphia's Ministry of Magic Vault. The orb from the safe, which had also held a cloak. Judging from Zenith's reaction to the recent Griffin-related experience, I deducted that it had been a zebra stealth cloak. I decided abruptly that I didn't want to spend the weight lying sweaty and wiping on and whipped on Calamity's porch, so I floated at the memory orb and focused on it. And immediately, I knew it was a mistake. Remembering that the orb had come from a ruined box and was likely damaged itself, but it was too late. My body exploded, every nerve being flayed as I was burning over and over without dying. I knew my real body must be screaming and thrashing, but the pain was too intense to even fear for my safety. In fact, falling from the cliffside and being dashed to the ground below would have been a mercy. A thousand white-hot knives slide through my brain. An eye blink, or an eternity later, the pain stopped as abruptly as it had started. And I was no longer myself. I wasn't even a pony. This was a familiar strangeness, and I couldn't feel I could feel the cloak draped about me, the hood over my mane and ears, as well as a saddle pouch and something strapped to my side. This too was familiar. I was invisible again. A fact all too easy to glean as I watched a stallion admire himself in the mirror. A mirror, which should also react to my host from this angle, but did not. My host was a zebra in a stealth cloak, possibly the same one as before. If you won't accept my offer, then you should at least consider availing yourself to your good fortune that I am willing to pose for your new publication, the stallion suggested as he preened himself. He was a regal, haughty white unicorn, quite handsome in his elderly age. I am, after all, the best pony. Hardly, intoned an elegant voice, which could only belong to Rarity. If the stallion had noticed the slightly disparaging tone, he showed no indication of comprehending it. There is no place for grandstanding or glory hounds in the Ministry of Image. Our purpose here is to help the client shine across Equestria, not ourselves. And our client is all of Equestria itself. We should remain invisible. With a politely sweet tone, she encouraged. Perhaps you should try the Ministry of Awesome. We were in an office, a rather nice one at that. The elegant curtains and gold trim on the wainscoting, it certainly lacked the humbleness I had come to expect from the Ministry of Image Building which told me this was no MI hub, but the Ministry's headquarters a Ministry Walk in Canterlot, the one place where even the Ministry of Image would have to maintain an image. That's easy for you to say, the stallion frowned. You're already in charge of one of the most important branches of Princess Luna's government. You're already in a position far beyond your wildest pleasant dreams. Wow. I was quickly forming a rather strong dislike for this buck. Rarity's 
repulsive was controlled. Calm. Even charming. Humility was a lesson hard learned. In fact, it's called maturing. Something which, sadly, you seem to have little acquaintance with. This is some sort of revenge, isn't it? Amazingly, the stallion still hadn't bothered to glance at the beautiful Mary he was talking to. If he was the subject of my host's surveillance, then the magical cloak seemed superficial. A lady is not vengeful, Rarity informed him with a refined tone. But you are not a lady, the stallion replied thoughtlessly. You are a government official. I wanted to deck him. You are quite fortunate that I am a lady, Rary responded, her voice lowering, and that I do not have a nearby cake. I had no idea what cake had to do with the conversation, but at least my host finally turned her attention to the gorgeous white unicorn. Again, she looked younger than I had expected, and there was no gray in her hair yet. She really knows how to take good care of herself, I thought, admiringly. I bet she dyes her mane. And I am a prince, the stallion informed her, finally designing uh, to turn his gaze away from himself and towards the mayor he was addressing. Proposal? Really? Rarity rolled her eyes. I have long operated on the assumption that your lineage was a joke perpetrated by Princess Celestia on... She paused thoughtfully before continuing. Any pony who has ever met you. Rarity's horn glowed. If you were to accept my proposal, then you would be a princess. The prince continued, obliviously. Oh, goddesses, fuck me in a three-way. This jerk actually proposed to Rarity? That's what he meant by accepting his offer? A proposal isn't an offer. It's a request. Rarity glanced around. Then sighed. Yes. And you would gain a hoof in one of the most powerful ministries in Equestria. Or, at least, that would be what you would seem to think. She looked... Eskins. I can't imagine a world where that would be worth it. The prince huffed. You speak as if I'm not sacrificing greatly myself in this arrangement. As your husband... Husband... I would almost certainly be expected to have relations with you. Unbelievable. I focused, trying to make my host run over and buck him through sheer force of will. Rarity stared silently. Her eyes slowly narrowed. Her horn glowing briefly again. This conversation is over, Prince Blue Blood. It is time for you to leave. If you have any further business, please address it to any pony other than me. Your presence causes me physical pain. I am a prince, and a member of high royal standing in the courts of Canterlot. You would do well to... But I don't want to, Rarity interrupted. I don't like you. In fact, I find you quite horrid. I despise that my position requires me to acknowledge your existence. I am much worse give you the occasion or time of day but that time has come to a close goodbye prince blueblood huffed standing tall you have no place to complain it is i who should oh i'm not complaining rarity's eyes narrowed dangerously i'm whining if i was complaining i would suggest there is a higher authority to complain too but there is not I am the highest authority within this ministry. Observe. Rarity trotted to her desk and pushed a button with her hoof. Oh, guards! She turned to smile at the unicorn stallion as the double doors at the end of the room swung open and two guard ponies appeared. Prince Blueblood backpedaled, startled. Please escort the prince off the property. If he resists, arrest him. I would have enjoyed the show had my host not backed away, heart beating slightly faster. She turned 
our head, and I felt my teeth biting down on the object, struck to her side. It was the hilt of a sheathed blade. The zebra silently drew it. The guards did as the ministry may requested. Prince Blueblood showed enough intelligence to not resist. I had hoped that once they were gone, my host would resheath her blade. But the zebra clearly had other plans. We were alone with Rarity in her office. And she couldn't see us. Unbelievable, she nickered, echoing my previous thought. The elder unicorn had her back to us, her head lowered as she focused on something on her desk as my host began to creep closer. No! I tried to shout a warning. The zebra turned her head, aiming the blade for the back of Rarity's neck, right in the lush of her mane. I could feel my host tensed for the strike. Rarity stifled, or shifted slightly, her horn glowing as one of the gems in front of her desk slid aside, revealing a secret lock that demanded her attention. Please, no! I felt something shift on the zebra's saddle pouch, a new weight. Suddenly, frantically, my host black backed up. I heard the detonation, felt a brutal pressure and searing pain, and then nothing. My host fell, unmoving, save for a twinging she could barely feel. It was as if her entire body had grown numb. Simply unbelievable, reiterated Rarity, as she elegantly turned, staring to where we had collapsed invisibly on the floor. I heard more than a f uh, I had heard more than felt the cloak being pulled from my host, glowing in a blue magical field that mirrored the soft light trancing from the spirals around Rarity's horn. The moment it was removed, both the cloak and my host became visible. Rarity paid us no attention, floating the cloak to her and flipping through the rough fabric about until she found the gemstone clasp. There you are, my pretty, she said, telekinetically ripping the gemstone free, breaking the clasp in the process. Oh, don't you have some interesting magic? She said as she appraised the gem, tossing the rest of the cloak aside. Twy will love taking a closer look at you. I realized I was seeing the inception of stealth bucks. I recalled a message, but I found a recruitment center. Intelligence suggested that the zebras have developed invisibility spell fetishes, and this looks like something designed by the Ministry of Magic. In the prevailing paranoia of late wartime Equestria, somebody had feared the worst, not knowing that Twilight Sparkle knew. But the zebra had gotten this magic from us. Hadn't gotten this magic from us. We had gotten it from them. The long, wicked blade lay on the carpet where it had fallen, close, yet impossibly out of reach. My host tried to move towards it, but her body wouldn't respond. I slipped a stun grenade into your saddle pouch, Rarity informed us, moving the gemstone out of sight. I'd like to think I'm rather expert in manipulating cloth, even if I can't see it. The zebra shuffled closer to her blade. Really? Rarity said, with a ladylike scoff. She floated the blade away, turning a disdainful gaze on us. A zebra assassin attempted to infiltrate my office and murder me, concealed under a cloak with an enhanced gemstone? I leaned closer. I'd explain how I got my cutie mark, but it wouldn't do you any good where you're going. Another cocoon of blue wrapped around the headset on the desk and floated it over to her head, gently sliding into place around her ears and muzzle. Although, I do have to wonder... Were you trying to assassinate one of Nightmare Moon's cabinet? She asked, turning her tail to us as she slid out of the room. Alright, she slid open the hidden compartment in her desk. Or, were you after this? Rarity cantered to face us. Floating in front of her was a powerful, dark tome, bounded twisted, black hide. The moment I saw the book, I knew it held many secrets. So many things just waiting for me, to, for me to unlock, if only I could look at the pages. Well, I suppose we'll find out, won't we? 
Rarity promised. She lifted a hoof to the headset. Her expression instantly changed to one of barely bridled joy. Oh, Pinkie Pie, this is Rarity. I've got a present for you, she smiled. You'll love this one.